Welcome to the Westside Investors Network, WIN, your community of investing knowledge for growth. This is the Real Estate Professionals Investing Podcast for real estate professionals by real estate professionals. This show is focused on the next step in your career, investing. Thank you for listening. And please, if you like our content, rate us on your podcast provider. And now your hosts, AJ and Chris Shepard. Just a quick disclaimer, the views and opinions expressed in this podcast are for educational purposes only and should not be construed as an offer to buy or sell any shares or securities, make or consider any investments or take any other action. We've got Van Sturgeon with us today. Van is an investor and renovation mentor, and he will share with us the best way to go about developing a system for rehabs. He discusses how you can plan and manage your renovation to get the best ROI on your investment. We also discuss why scope of work is so crucial to start a project and implement a successful renovation process. So let's welcome Van Sturgeon. All right. Well, thanks, Van, for being on the show with us today. Do you want to just tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got to where you are today? Well, sure. I will, first of all, like to thank you both for having me on your podcast. I've been listening to you and I've been an admirer of yours. So thank you for having me. I'm a general contractor and a real estate investor. I originally got started as a general contractor and then in Chicago in the late 80s, early 90s, and I was out there soliciting business. I just finished off university, decided that I wanted to get into this, into the business. And as I tried to slowly grow my business over a period of time, I kept running into the same folks, same people, these real estate investors who were buying properties and then flipping them or buying properties and creating rental portfolios. And that's then how I got embarked on being a real estate investor, where I was doing general contracting on one side, but on the other end also, I was working on flipping homes and trying to create and eventually created a rental portfolio. So that's really where I'm at. Right now, I'm sort of, I'm in a semi-retirement stage of my life. Uh, I've been doing this for over 30 years. I still have these ongoing businesses and general contracting. I'm a builder as well, and, and I do restoration work on commercial as well as residential buildings. And I've got some really great people that are in place from partners along with just employees that have been with me for you know, 20, 30 years. And so right now, I've sort of downshifted in my life. I've taken, a, it's taken this whole real estate thing has, has been an amazing trip. It's taken a lot out of me and my family. So right now, I just check in on my interests and, and then I just, I'm helping people out right now. So I'm really concentrated and focused on helping real estate investors who have already gone through several renovations, rehabs of their properties, and they're struggling to figure out, you know, what's the best way to go about things. And I've developed the systems and you have through all these experiences, I've literally done thousands of renovations, whether it's residential, commercial, and I've got these systems that I've created through the process of over that 30 years that I like to get out there and help people out and try to implement, help them implement these systems so that, you know, they maintain the control over their renovations or rehabs, and they're able to produce a product that's, you know, that's efficient, and they're able to drive the highest ROIs on their investments. So that's what I'm doing. That is great. I kind of want to just back up just a tiny bit, but like, how did you initially get into real estate? Like what kind of drove you to, to get into it? Well, I'm a product of the late sixties and I grew up in Chicago, as I mentioned, and my parents were, were immigrants who came to the country and, and were, were living in a one bedroom apartment in Chicago and what they wanted to do, they were saving up their money to buy their dream home. And as they were saving their money up, they somehow discovered that the apartment building that they were living in had gone up for sale. And so instead of buying that dream home, they decided to become landlords. And, wow. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And so they purchased this. Uh, they put their down payment down, borrowed money from friends and family, and were able to actually purchase this little uh, apartment building. That they and, were living in. That were living in. That's right. So we oh became my landlords. Gosh. What an building. amazing story. Yeah. So from tennis, became landlords. And so that was during a period of time in th that happened in the late 70s. It was a building that was fully occupied when they purchased it. It was a nice neighborhood. And then what ended up happening was over a period of time, pretty quickly in the late 70s, things started to turn really badly. You, know, you had interest rates that skyrocketed. You had that ran hostage situation. The economy was horrible. It was just a miserable, it was just a miserable time. And, and because of that, there was a mass migration out of the city into the suburbs. And what you ended up creating in our neighborhood was that the criminal element started to get in. And we started to see a huge spike in vacancy rates in our building, like to the point where 
there was periods of time where my old man was walking through the building and it was half of it was vacant. It was, it got, it got pretty bad pretty quick. And so as a family who just purchased this product, this building, and it was their only thing that they had, we had to learn very quickly how to do our own rehab renovations of our, of our building. Like whenever a tenant would move out to paint it, replace the carpeting, to refinish the hardwood, to do the roof, the windows, whatever it took for us to survive, we did on our own. So I had that background in, in renovations and construction and re- that kind of thing, rehabbing right from the get-go. We were able to hold on. We got through that period of time. It was just so miserable, boys. I, let me tell you, like there was periods of time where I would be walking through neighborhoods and there'd be buildings potmarked on my neighborhood where landlords couldn't hold on. They would torch their buildings to collect their insurance money. Literally, they would set wow. their buildings on fire. No way. And, and to collect insurance money because they just couldn't hold on. Can you imagine if you just bought a property and you're expecting it to be fully occupied or at least a little bit, you know, there might be a little bit of a vacancy rate, but then all of a sudden get whacked over the head with 30 or 40 or 50% vacancy, that hurt a lot of people. So in my neighborhood, I can remember walking yeah. through and I can, these buildings would be just be derelict. They would just be vacant. They would just sit there with the landlord collecting insurance money. Van, I got a question for you. What were maybe some external factors during that time? I know you mentioned interest rates, but that might be like different than today. Like I feel that that's kind of an interesting thing. Like my brother and I weren't alive during that time that you're speaking of. And I'm sure that some of our listeners weren't either, but kind of maybe getting your insights as to like, why was it like that? Well, what had happened was during that period of time, we started to see a transition in the demographics and also just people were looking to get out of the city area, moving off in the suburbs. So you had families migrating out for larger properties. It was a period of time where you saw a lot of big cities, not only Chicago, but Detroit, New York, Los Angeles go through a pretty difficult time because you had that tax base leave, leave and run to the suburbs for cheaper homes and bigger properties. Now, you, that's sort of kind of transitioned and changed over the last you know, 10, 15 years where you've seen a renaissance in a lot of these cities. I'm pretty active in Detroit and it's phenomenal what the kind of things that we're seeing over there in transition. Same thing with Cleveland. I'm also active over there as well. So that was the underlying thrust or strength associated with that vacancy rate increasing. And also interest rates played a huge role. Inflation rate was crazy. Like there was a period of time where interest rates were at 16, 18, 20%. Yeah. And, yeah. And I remember our really, dad telling us about those times too. I think he actually still has, he did some lease options and his options on stuff is still up at like 12% on stuff. So it was a blip, like that whole period of time that it, it might've been a six month, 12 month kind of window where we were interest rates went up that high, but still nevertheless, <laughs> there were mortgages out there for 10 and 12%. And, you know, when you're doing arithmetic, you know, it's a numbers game as you gentlemen know. You know, it's, it's just the numbers that wouldn't make sense. Yeah. Uh, As the interest rate goes up, the value of the property goes down. <laughs> yeah. That- so the, the one major factor that we're kind of leaving out here is that Nixon at that time defaulted on the gold standard. So he admitted that there wasn't enough gold in the Federal Reserve to back all of the dollars that were out there. And that is what caused the huge inflation rates because there were plenty of people selling the dollar. And this is true. It but devalued kind of, overnight. But also, I don't want to get political, but also what really compounded the problem during that period of time was you had a very ineffective leader in Jimmy Carter who came in and tried to keep pounding about being environmentally friendly and, and those types of initiatives. And at the same time, raising taxes on folks and it just re- led to just a spiraling down. And it's interesting how that period of time is sort of reminiscent of what we're going through right now, where we have inflation now starting to creep up pretty dramatically. And instead of the devaluation or the changing the value of the dollar based on gold to you know, the you know, full faith and yeah, trust money. Leaders, Right. And so now we have a government where we are printing money at historically high rates. We're pumping it out. We're buying our own bonds. We're printing more money. We're buying our own bonds. And the argument is to be made is how long can that last? And that's another well, and we, we also have today. people moving to the suburbs. I mean, we've seen housing prices in the suburbs just skyrocket and the condo market has kind of stayed flat. I mean, we're mm-hmm. from Portland, Oregon and 
we've been in the national news a fair amount because a little portion of downtown looks like a war zone. So, I mean, there, there's definitely some similar trends going on, which is, which is kind of interesting. And the Fed seems to have said that they're not going to raise interest rates, but I can only imagine that, that that's going to be for a short amount of time before they, they're going to have to, I would think. I would think so too, but here's the problem. My understanding is, and from what I read uh, in the data, that if interest rates were to climb to that 6 7% rate, the US government wouldn't be able to pay the interest on all that money that's out there that they borrowed. So there's a limit to how far we could keep pumping money or you know, borrowing money. There's got to be an end game here, and I don't know what that is. You know, yeah. there's a lot of conspiracies out there about <laughs> you know this the great reset. You know, the button that's going to yeah. be pushed by all because you know, fairness to the U.S., all these countries are doing it. From Canada, Australia, Japan is the biggest, the most egregious of them all. China is up there too. They're just printing money and they're borrowing money, and it's all based on the you know full faith and credit of that particular government or country. So how long can this continue? I don't know. Japan's been doing it for the last 20 some odd years and they, they, <laughs> they keep it rolling <laughs> and they keep rolling. So I don't know. I don't know. It could be five years from now, two years from now, 20 years from now. But I think that there would be a day of reckoning. And maybe perhaps that's the reason why we see hard assets like the stuff that we're in appreciate so dramatically over the last several years is because of that, because interest yeah. rates, I mean, sorry, it, because inflation has spiked and people are rushing to hard assets, you know, keeping money in your bank, bank account, you know, it used to be a time my grandparents would keep you know, money in a savings account or buy a CD and collect five, seven percent interest rate on that. Well, those days are gone. Actually, I think they might even get to a point where they're going to charge you money to keep money in your checking account or you know places like that. So it's our bank does it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, the one thing that I kind of keep an eye on is kind of a a wage and price spiral up just. You know, seeing services, assets, goods, you know, CPI moving up and that actually going up and then wages going up to match that, that can get into a dangerous spiral. And that is what happened in the 70s is that wages and and prices went up. And the only way to kind of curb that is to increase the interest rates to try and curb inflation and so, uh, so I'm Tough curious one. to know, as we're having this con- beautiful, great conversation, what is your take over the next 18 months to you know, the, the next five years? Where do you see real estate going, especially on, you know, on the, the stuff that we like to dabble in on you know, rental properties as well as you know, multifamily? Like, what do you think? Where are we going to be in 18 months time? Because there's this dark cloud of this moratorium being lifted. And there are some people who believe that all of a sudden we're going to be awash with properties. And there's also, you know, all that kind of stuff. What do you guys, what's your take on that? We operate a property management company as well. And the statistics nationally, I think are probably a lot worse off in some areas than they are in in some. And I think that I'm very bullish on real estate. I believe that, you know, even if inflation does come, the value of a house is still the value of the house. So as the dollar rises, the value of asset is, is going to rise. I'm a little concerned about interest rates just because some of the larger commercial loans may be variable after a five-year or a 10-year period, just depending on the type of loan that you have. But I still think that as assets and inflation happens, assets are going to increase. And as services go up, rent is certainly going to go up. We're in Portland where there is a bit of rent control, but it's not the like no rent increases. It's it's up to a certain amount. So I still think that, you know, if you can make a 10% rent increase every year, which is the case, and it's based off of CPI. So if CPI goes up, then you can actually make larger rent increases. Well, that's still pretty good. So I'm still bullish on being in real estate and purchasing it, even though it does seem like right now to be fairly arduous to try to find more deals and, and get into stuff just because there's not a lot out there. I agree that, you know, asset prices, like right now is a, is a really great time to own assets or to acquire new assets. But, you know, as the interest rate, I guess, scenario changes, then it gets a little more murky. So I'm very bullish right now, but as we see, CPI and inflation go up, then 
like that gets a little tempered. And once they start pumping interest rates up, like I feel like real estate investors need to have prepared for that because, you know, who knows what the Fed is going to do exactly. And I get, but we see that high inflationary time asset values. I mean, commercial asset values are either going to stop growing or potentially even go down during that time period. So it's something that real estate investors need to prepare for. I agree with you two gentlemen, but I will also preface my agreement by saying, we'll see, nobody's got a crystal ball, but right now we are cap rates have compressed, you know, sometimes in many situations at historic levels. And it's all based on how low the interest rate and mortgage rates are. As we're moving forward, when we start to see the tick up, I question how vibrant that multifamily, the commercial side will be. So are they going to be so euphoric in trying to purchase properties when you have that, you know, there's a transition now from a lower, moving lower now to somewhere stable and probably will start to increase. I think I see mortgage rates going, uh, moving up, moving up from where these historic levels are, have been, and that's going to throw some water on the real estate market. Then, so in the interim, over the next 12 to 18 months, I think the Federal Reserve's, their hands are tied. I think they're just going to stay status quo just to get the economy back on track. But then I think they're going to have to start uh, decreasing rates. And if that happens, you're going to see a snapback in you know how aggressive guys are out there chasing because I see some crazy stuff you know three or four cap rates on you know beautiful properties but it's got you know one wrong move and one miscalculation and you're you got a problem you got a problem on your hands it can go south pretty quick well yeah. Van we brought you on here to talk about rehabs oh, yeah. so I am going to steer the conversation that way right now so. Kind of give us maybe a rundown. I know that you mentioned processes and streamlining. Kind of tell us what it is that you do best and maybe some some information on, you know, how to how to perform that the best way. And I believe we're talking about, you know, taking a duplex or a fourplex that's been outdated, hasn't been updated in 20 plus years and coming in and kind of, you know, making it better and making sure that you don't pay an arm and a leg for that. Sure. Well, the 30,000 foot level is that the fundamentals of being a successful real estate investor are, first of all, you need to find a deal. And there's that saying out there that you know, money is made on the deal. Yeah, and money's made when you buy the deal. That's like right. It's, there's got to be some scratch on the table there, right? Correct. And oftentimes I find real estate investors, especially the new ones, they rush over to that MLS and hoping and that they can pick through it and find a deal where millions of other eyeballs are staring at those same deals. So you got to learn a process. You got to figure out how to get that deal. Then that deal, whatever that deal is, inevitably is going to require some type of improvement. We're in the business as a real estate investors to acquire properties that are ugly ducklings, that are diamonds in a rough, that have issues with them that we need to address. And typically that is, in this, you know, it needs renovation. It needs a rehabbing of that actual property. And so that is a fundamental skill set that folks need to learn and being able to not only find a great deal, but I also say that you, be able, you need to be able to have a good understanding of that whole process and being able to have those two skill sets to be a successful real estate investor. Oftentimes, I find folks, especially new ones who walk into the market and they acquire that first property, that their first inclination is to do two, two things with that property. Either they're going to do the DIY route and, or they're going to hire a general contractor that's going to look after that renovation rehab. Well, unfortunately, Hollywood has romanticized this whole DIY thing where you buy a property and 30 minutes later, all of a sudden you have this beautiful property that you made tens of thousands of dollars of profit on. And, I, like and that. I like that just like 30 minutes later, just done, shiny and new. But isn't that true, AJ? Isn't that yeah. like, uh, you know, just watch, there's so many gurus I mean, they make it. They make it look so easy. <laughs> yeah. And unfortunately, you and I know that that ain't the case. That it requires a little bit more than that. And also folks, you know, if you've got a job and you don't have the time to do that DIY. And also I've got scars all over my body that I can tell you, tell, show you over the last 30 years where things <laughs> haven't gone the way they should have gone on doing the work yourself. So I don't recommend that approach. And I think most people won't go down that direction. So they'll go out and hire a general contractor. And that is something that is reaped with problems and things that folks need to be aware of. And I'm speaking as a general contractor. 
that you need to, first of all, understand that as general contractors, this is a business for them. And it's not something that they're doing for free, that there is a cost associated with planning and managing a renovation that they're going to look after a rehab of a property. And that you need to, if you're going to go that direction, there are certain things that you need to do to put in place so that you can safeguard your interests in terms of that, that renovation rehab to try to get the best or highest ROI. What I'm proposing as a third option is that I like to f- see people learn this new skill set. And the only way to learn this skill set is to actually do the planning and the managing of their own renovation, rehab of a property, where they act as their own general contractor and replace that individual. And by dealing directly with the electrician, the plumber, the painter in the overall whole work associated with getting that property to that final stage where you're either going to sell it and you're going to flip it, or you're going to go out there and rent it. So the process starts by, first of all, and I see a lot of folks not doing this, is that you need to get out there and you need to create a goal that's associated with this property. Like, what is it that you're looking to accomplish? Well, if it's a flip, great. What is it that you're looking to to make out of that flip? Or if you're going to rent the property out, what is the rental rate that you're looking at? Because once you have that goal and you have written down, you got to get out there in the marketplace and validate that. You got to get out there and you got to walk the streets. You got to visit properties that have sold or up for sale and find out what these properties have that, that your property doesn't. You need to get out there and you need to really get finding those specific details that you can then use towards your property. So if I'm looking to rent my property out for $1,200 a month, logically, you need to get out there in the media market and find out those properties are renting for $1,200 and find out what those properties have that your property does not. Once you have that goal validated, you understand what it is that you can accomplish. Next step would be to actually figure out the budget side of it, meaning where are the money? Where's the money going to come from associated with this? Is it coming from cash? Is this from a line of credit? Is this from you know, hard money lenders that will come in, step in and facilitate this. Those are the types of things that a lot of people stumble. Have well, I, think, I think a lot of people too, Van, like struggle in coming up with how much money is that going to be, right? Like with no experience or, you know, having not done it themselves, like how, how do they come up with a budget or kind of like what stuff is going to cost, you know, and maybe they haven't, you know, made a whole bunch of trips to Home Depot and getting sure. into buy materials or, or that sort of stuff. Like what, what sort of advice can you give towards, you know, developing that, that kind of first budget? Well, in conjunction with figuring out that side, there's a process that I like folks to initiate and it's called creating a needs and wants list where they actually go through the property and identify the items that needs to be done to that property. So there's needs where the have to, things that have to be done. If there's a broken window that's allowing the elements in that needs to be addressed, that's a need. If there's a hole in the roof that's, that's leaking, you need, to, you need to, that's a need. You need to do something about that. But then you should create another side of that ledger. That's a want list is things that, you want to have accomplished, but are not necessary. So if you have some lime green carpet from the 1980s in a family room that, you know, that doesn't look all that great, but still it's not a trip hazard. It's still, you know, you can clean it up and you can use it. Then maybe that's something that you put on that want list that if you have the money in the kitty to address it, then great. If not, then you don't do it. Oftentimes I find investors, especially in the beginning, you know, folks that have done a couple of renos or rehabs, they're over renovating their property. They're spending too much money. And this is one of the exercises that I like folks to go through so that you know, at the end of the day, it's a business. We need to maximize our rate of return on the investment that we're making. So creating that list in conjunction with figuring out where this monies are going to come from gives you sort of crystallizes what it is that you're looking to accomplish within this property. Then you move on to the next phase, which is Actually, one of the things I think is probably second most important in this whole process, and, and that's creating a scope of work. And it's a document, it's a detailed document associated what it is that you're looking to accomplish within this renovation rehab. Like I come from, as a general contractor, I'm on the commercial side as well as on a residential. And on the commercial side, it's almost non-existent that you would be undertaking a renovation rehab of a commercial property without a scope of work, a detailed scope of work. Now, oftentimes those scopes of work are created by an interior designer, architect, an engineer, 
But nevertheless, there's a document there that gives you a blow by blow account of what it is exactly that's going to be done to that property. Specifications of appliances, the color of the paint, the type of paint, you know, different qualities of paint. There's so many different variables that account for costs associated with a renovation rehab. You need to nail down in that scope of work. And once you have that, it's amazing then how things flow beautifully from that process because now you have, it's like trying to bake a cake without a recipe book. Like you can buy all the ingredients, but if you don't have a recipe to be able to follow, then you're not really going to get very far in baking that cake or baking a very good cake. So these are the types of things that I go through on a, on a daily basis in my business, in my renovations and rehabbing that folks need to really get out there pounding the drums and trying to get people to focus on and try and, and getting over that malaise and issues that they're having with contractors and trace people. Because right now, unfortunately, there's, I keep finding and hearing people telling me that it's really difficult to find good contractors, good trace people. And there's a reason for that. And that's because I, as a contractor, trace person wants to see somebody who is, who's on the ball, who's professional, who has their goals figured out, who has a scope of work that's detailed and know exactly what they want. Because I, a successful contractor, trace person wants to deal with those individuals because I, I know that me going in there, doing the work, banging it out and moving on to the next project and doing it, I deal with volume. That's how I make the most amount of money. I don't want to get drawn in and sucked into a project that the principal, the owner doesn't know what they want. They're not sure. It's taking them days, weeks, and months to figure out what they're looking for. And that's what the problem is. So when you see most of the time, what you see when you're driving around in your neighborhood and you see a dumpster in front of a house that's been there for six months, how often have we come across that where you're driving along and you see the same status? There hasn't been any movement in that particular property in terms of their renovation rehabbing. And it's because of that. There's a lot, there's this indecision that's been created. And that really originates from the property owner, the investor who hasn't figured it out before. Yeah. Van, there's a house down the street from my house. It was a new construction build and they've been working on it for four years. And <laughs> yeah, like I, I it looks it looks like it's done, but nothing's done inside. Right. It's no. so funny. It sounds like the the main most important document for you and your process is the scope of work. Is that correct? Yes, absolutely. Because really from there, when you have a detailed scope of work, then it's really easy because in the way that it's crafted, it's not just listing the specifications and the areas of work, but also it segments it into the different disciplines, the painter, the electrician, the plumber, so that I make their job easier, not only to know exactly what's being, what's going to happen in that project, but also makes it easier for them to quote as well. Like I spoon feed the trades and contractors in that they look at this document and they know exactly, they don't even have to come visit the project based on the information I provide in this document. It's easy for them to quote. And if you're dealing with busy contractors or trades people, if you are able to provide them with the information they need to quote, they will quote. Good contractors will quote. It's just a matter of giving them the information. Oftentimes, homeowners will just, you know, just make these phone calls, these generic phone calls to the, you know, these folks who are busy and say, oh, yes, I'm thinking of a renovation. I want to do something with my property. Well, that's great. What do you want to get done? Do you have something in writing? And if you don't have that, how am I supposed to react? I can't crawl into your head you know, Mr. Investor, or Mr. Homeowner, or Mr. Principal, to be able to figure that out, unless you've given me a, some sort of a document, something that's detailed. And this yeah. is where the difficulties and struggles happen is that investors and homeowners and property owners don't know what they want. And before you call a contractor, trace person, figure that side out before you start that's calling That's why around. it's impossible to find a contractor because the contractors don't want to walk into this murky situation. So- you mentioned a, a detailed scope of work. Do you want to walk us through, you know, kind of the, the major foundations? What's in a detailed scope of work for you? Sure. A detailed scope of work would break the property down into interior, exterior, and then in the actual interior itself, it would break it down further into individual rooms. And as you go through that process of creating that document, you're buzzing in and out of these different rooms and you're identifying what it is that you're looking to accomplish in each of these rooms and you're writing a detail and you're going to take pictures, you're going to do drawings, you know, sketch them out, perhaps even measurements. And you're going to go through all these rooms and you create this and you create this scope of work. 
I am looking to replace the hardwood floor in the living room. I want to replace it with XYZ manufacturer of this color, this size, this whatever. I wanted underlayment of this. All that information should be included in a proper detail scope of work so that when the when that trace person or contractor, whoever gets a copy of that scope of work, they can immediately go through the rooms, identify what it is that you're looking to accomplish within that project. But specifically then in that scope of work, I draw all of those different elements and I put them in each discipline within that document. So if there's hardwood floor going, for example, in the living room, in the family room, I'm going to pull those two items and I'm going to create a discipline within that document that says flooring installation. And I will place those two items there. So that when a contractor, a trace person is going through that uh, scope of work, they can immediately zero in and identify that area that they know that they need to quote. It really fine tunes and makes the contractors and trace person's life easier, invites them to really want to quote this. And you, by doing all this work ahead of time, also gives you a better sense of what it is that you're looking to accomplish within this project and how it's going to take you from where you are today and where you want to be tomorrow. So... A few questions. Are you using a certain type of software to help plan the scope of work? No, I do not. It's a series of clauses that I've accumulated over the last 30 years of processes that then I just take and plug in. That they're like whenever you whenever you are, I'll go back to the example of hardwood floors. If you go to the website of the manufacturer of that particular hardwood floor, it gives you the details associated with it, how yeah. to install it, what the manufacturer recommends. Yep. Yeah. And so what's wrong with taking that and just cutting and pasting that within the document or creating a DM saying, hey, I want you to follow the manufacturer's instructions of that particular hardwood floor from that person. You cover yourself. And you ensure that that whoever's going to be pricing out that job is going to read or should read those instructions and make sure you follow them. And if they don't, then we got a problem. Well, and you want to avoid those problems at all costs. <laughs> okay. And so the first question was software. And so, I mean, when you're kind of working on a pretty standard flip, how many different disciplines and what disciplines are you utilizing when you're planning out that scope of work? Well, see, that's the problem with having software or something that you just plug in and it spits out a widget or every renovation rehab is unique. And that's, I've got a bunch of information that I've accumulated over the years that I can tap into, but essentially every scope of work that you're going to create is unique to that project. Once you've understand the mythology associated with it, it's not difficult to create, but you have to understand the system or the mythology of how to create a proper detailed scope of work. It's amazing once you have that particular document, how everything else becomes so much easier because you internally have an understanding, a better understanding of what you should be seeing or looking for in your renovation rehab. And you're also putting a contract or trace person on notice that says, hey, this is what I want to accomplish within my project. No wishy-washy. This is what I want and price it out accordingly. And good contractors and trace people want that, appreciate that, and would much rather work with people that are professional in that regard than have to deal with that Lucy goosey I'm not sure, let me think about it, we'll fly, you know, fly by the seat of your pants kind of operation, because that just adds time and time is money to my life as a contractor or trace person. Hopefully I've answered your question. Yeah. So, Van, you also do coaching, right? Helping people learn your process. Where are you finding the major deficiencies in project planning with your newer investors? The biggest pain that I find right now, two, two pains, finding contractors and trace people to return your phone call. That's a, that's a big one. So if you have a project and you want to get quotes on it, I find that there's a lot of pain out there and people can't figure it out why they're not getting phone calls back. And I, time and time again, have proven that by virtue of having a scope of work and being professional, having all this information detailed and sending it out to a contractor trace person, you're going to get that phone call back because all the information is there. You're spoon feeding them to give you a quote. The second problem that I find is this whole issue of once you've been able to identify the electrician, the general contractor, whoever it is that's going to be working on your project, how do I keep them on my project and not have them disappear? 
that's another big problem. A lot of a, a huge pain is that people keep encountering is that, you know, they show up and they do some work and then they disappear. And then, then you know, it, it takes them forever to come back to finish their, the work. And there's a solution to that too. And that's in, in a matter of how you put a payment schedule together. There's this whole now, especially now over the last you know, 18, 6, 12 to 18 months where, you know, contractors, trace people are really busy. And it seems like there's not enough of them around to be able to do the work. And so these folks are asking for these huge deposits to be able to reserve them for their work. And that's a big red flag for me. I would never do that. And I'm speaking as a general contractor who has to deal with other trades. And I'm also a real estate investor who uses trades. I would never do that. And it's like the only place I would do that is if I was going to go into McDonald's to buy myself a, a quarter pounder where I got to pay money ahead of time before I get it, get my hamburger from. That, that's the only place I pay ahead of time. You should always structure your payment schedules where there are certain milestones that are reached. And once those milestones are reached, then you make payment. And if you're able to do that, you keep those individuals working because they'll take advantage of somebody else out there because they're working on other projects, not only yours, but they'll take advantage of other people who've you know, given them more money than they're supposed to, but they won't take advantage of you because you owe them money. Money is a critical element here in making sure that contractors and tradespeople do their job and they show up and they do what they're supposed to. So whenever a service is rendered, you make payment. Your service is rendered, you make payment. And the only deposit that you should be outlaying is perhaps in the beginning when there's materials that needs to be purchased for that contract or tradesperson to do work. But even then, I would try to limit that by strategically positioning in that you make that purchase yourself through the contractor and tying that purchase onto your name somehow. Because if there are any difficulties moving forward, if you don't do that, then legally, that material is owned by that tradesperson and contractor and not you. So the only monies that I'm going to be putting out is actual for the material purchases. And that's all. There is no need to put up. I hear some crazy amounts, like 50% upfront before they've lifted a finger that people are for outlaying. And if you're in that, if you've done that, what kind of leverage do you have? What kind of, what can you do if that person doesn't show up or they're not doing the work properly? You don't have any leverage. Yeah, that's a really good point. One of the things that we implement is we buy all the materials and always get just like labor only quotes. And that also requires us to know what we want to purchase, which is a big help for a lot of contractors too, right? Like, then you're not you know, what you're saying is get it detailed out on the scope of work, exactly what you're going to be installing. But if you're actually the one purchasing the materials and you're going and picking them up and you're picking them out, then it just saves time for the contractor and they know that they can come in, do their work and then, and then get out. And like you said, you know, having the contractor be able to do volume is, is where they appreciate you as an investor too. So I really like that. I totally agree with you. The only issue that I, especially in the beginning, if you're, you know, you're doing, this is your first, you know, you're doing, this is your second, third or fourth project that I like to have a supply and install price. I will structure it in a way that I can buy the material, but I want them to be responsible for the material in, in that it's a part of their whole quote or their estimate, their invoicing, because what are you going to do if you have you know, 12 extra boxes of hardwood floor? What are you going to do with a couple of gallons or whatever leftover paint? And those are the types of things that it's amazing if you have the contract or trace person responsible for that. It's, you see, it's, it's amazing to see how efficient they are in making sure that they use every, you know, they don't throw anything away or leave anything behind. And so that's why I understand where you're coming from. And that's more of an experienced individual once you get further into that. But as a, as a novice, I like to structure it in a way that you know, these folks are responsible for it, the you know, contractors or trace people. And that way, I'm not saddled with product that I don't know what to do with. Because oftentimes, you can't return it. If you've got paint, you can't return that paint. Yeah, that is kind of the nice element is that you'll end up with a job site that doesn't have a ton of extra construction materials. And at the end of the job, like sometimes when we're doing labor only bids, even if it's in the contracts, you know, that the contractor needs to keep the job clean and take any garbage away that they need to, inevitably there's going to be a mess to clean up at the end of the job. So having the contractor be responsible for the materials can curb that a little bit. So I like that. 
Yeah, well, listen, if you're responsible for the material and the contractor, because they are a tradesperson, just wants to make sure that they have enough material, they're going to order more or are going to ask for more than what they need just to make sure that they have enough. And so I've seen so many times I've taken that approach where you've got a really a lot of material and now what are you going to do with it? So in the beginning, unless you have other projects, like again, if you're a seasoned investor, and you're going to create a system where then the next flip, you can use that same material. Yeah. But in the beginning, I would like to just let them take responsibility of it. And that way I don't throw money out because I don't know what to do with this material. So kind of diving back into the detailed scope of work, what do you think are, you know, from going from not having a scope of work or like a very limited document, what are the easy wins for a real estate investor to invest a little bit more time into and learn a little bit more about so that they're able to communicate and detail out something, you know, whether it's hardwood flooring or painting or rough and plumbing or rough and electrical, like what are areas that can be easy wins for novice investors? Well, in terms of creating the scope of work, the easy ones would be, I've always talked about the exterior as being easy to sort of create a scope of work for. And also it's the easiest or the best returns on your investment. I always encourage folks when they're thinking of doing a renovation rehab of a property, that curb appeal should be the first and foremost that they should be concentrating on addressing on their particular property. Because that is, I believed, and I've seen it, the most important component when you're looking to flip a house or property, or when you're looking to rent a property out. And those dollars are give you the best bang for your buck. So in creating a scope of work where you have a detail associated with the landscaping, painting a front door, the particular color, those types of things should be included as scope of work and should be one of the things that you should be concentrating your efforts on because it gives you and delivers the highest ROI in the overall project. Awesome. Well, Van, appreciate you coming on. I think now it's probably time to get to our, our last four questions. So I'm going to start off with the first one. What's one piece of advice you would give to your 25-year-old self? In general, I believe that folks, especially when you're young, you're trying to figure it out. And I encourage everybody that we're all blessed with at least one gift. And some people are fortunate enough to have several gifts that are really good at. They're either good at you know, great bakers, singers, something that makes it effortless for them to do. So at that age, I strongly encourage folks to just figure out what it is they're really good at and and really zero in on that and work it. And ultimately, the success and happiness associated with you know exploiting that gift that you have that you know the universe God ultimately gave you is really the the path of least resistance to you know success and happiness for you. And it's all around us. There you can be extremely successful in so many different things. Whether like as I mentioned, writing a book, being a baker. Like I am very good at you know, renovations, figuring out issues and problems associated with construction. You know, folks behind my back will call me that problem solver. That's my nickname because I can walk into a project and figure it out, you know, what the issues are and really lay out a game plan to address the problem. And I enjoy that. I'm passionate about it. I love it. I'm really good at it. So everyone needs to do that. I think that at that age, in terms of like real estate at age 25, like I really at that time, I remember patience. Like real estate is a long game. It's not, it's not a wham, bang, you know, thank you, ma'am. You got to really, it requires a lot of time and effort and patience associated with trying to get you from where you are today to where you want to be tomorrow. And so as a younger 25-year-old, that's what I would stress, patience. I really like that. I heard a study the other day that stated, you know, when you're trying to find your passion, people who invest and work really hard at something are actually end up being more passionate than someone who is constantly switching from passion to passion. And I found that very interesting because, you know, you always hear about, you know, work, you know, do what you love, but it's funny that if you work really hard at something that ends up being what you love. I I agree with you. Maybe some of that has to do with what comes first, the chicken or the egg. I do really, truly believe that we are all blessed with at least something that we're really good at, 
God has blessed us with something that we're, we're really good at, we're passionate about, and we love to do. If you can just find what that is, it's amazing what you can accomplish moving forward and the, the happiness and the success that you can derive from that one thing that you're really good at and exploiting it. That's what I've been able to do in my life. And it's interesting, the people that I know of that are, you know, have achieved uh, some level of high success are all individuals that find whatever they're doing effortless. They, they don't, what I do, I don't find work. Like I, it's not work for me. I enjoy waking up in the morning and doing what I'm doing. And you got to find that as well. Everybody needs to find that. And yeah. if I was that 25 year old, I'm talking to that 25 year old, that's what I would be telling them. All right. And then on to our next question. What was your first entrepreneurial endeavor? Well, the first one, as I touched on in the beginning, was I was a general contractor and opened up my little business in the late 80s and was out there knocking on doors, trying to create relationships and trying to grow my business. And thankfully, during that period of time, it was easier. It was a period of time where I, I found traction in the marketplace. And so that was my first endeavor, being a general contractor. Cool. Okay. And then how has your formal and informal journey or informal training shaped your journey? Well, on the informal side, I talked about what my what I did in Chicago with my folks in an informal way. I got a huge lesson in you know, renovating and rehabbing and doing what it needs to be done in terms of a property and you know, taking cutting the corners necessary to be able to get to drive a product to generate success. And so that was a good thing. But also at the same time, it was not a good thing because what ended up happening was I turned into a micromanager. So and early on when I became a general contractor, I had to do everything myself. One out of necessity because I wanted to make money and save as much money as possible, not hire out. But also at the same time, it was just a mindset that I had that I had to do everything because I was the only one that could do it the best way or the most efficient way. But with that type of mindset, there's only so far that you can go before you, you burn out. And that's what actually happened to me as I was growing my general contracting business. I was also dabbling in real estate investing and flipping houses and all that kind of stuff. And I literally was burning a candle at both ends. I was sleeping at job sites and it got into, I had been, I gotten married and I didn't even go on my honeymoon. I was focused on my business and, and all that stuff. And I was sleeping at job sites because I was the only one that could do it. And I woke up one night in, in the middle of the night, staring at this freshly painted ceiling and all these issues, problems associated with this flip that had gone wrong, kept bombarding me. I couldn't go back to sleep. And I, and I realized that, hey, this is not a way to go, man. I can't live my life this way. So I reached out to somebody that I, that I saw that I wanted to be, I wanted Emily. There was a real estate investor in Chicago. You know, he was an older gentleman. He was, he was fit. He was tan. He had everything going for him. He had a beautiful rental property portfolio. He had a vacation home down in Florida. He had everything that I wanted. So I reached out to him and I said, hey, can you help me? And thankfully, he took me under his wing. I paid him a lot of money as a coach, but he was able to sit me down and walk me through the whole process of what it is that I was making, what mistakes I was making, put me in the right frame of mind, and it was from there, it was like a springboard of all these great opportunities and successes that I've been able to enjoy in my life, sprang from that involvement of that individual. So it was the best investment that I ever made. It wasn't in a property. It was in that individual, in that you know, mentorship, the coaching that I received that really you know, is a result of who I am today. And I have continued that. Like I've continued that, Chris, over the last 30 years. I'm, I've, you know, in my head, roughly calculated, I must have spent over you know, 200 some odd thousand dollars in coaching, mentorship, seminars, books. I've done everything. And every single one of it had a little, you know, a little nugget here, a little nugget there that I've been able to use. Like the silly, like, like things like I've read Donald Trump's book and I grabbed a nugget out of that book that I actually used. Now, I, I spent maybe a couple of days reading the book. I might have spent $20 of reading that Art of the Deal by Donald Trump. But I actually learned something from that book that I was able to apply practically in my business. And so, Drawing this, all this information is what I, you know, I've been able to do and, and educate myself. Yeah, I agree with that. The best investment you can make is in yourself, whether it's by engaging a coach who has more experience, who can teach you what you don't know, and also look at what you're doing and, be, and being able to identify that where you're either wasting time or making big mistakes is, is a huge opportunity. AJ and I have a coach as well, and it, you know, it's highly beneficial. 
Chris, I'm going to um, say quickly, I'll just say quickly. It's like learning, trying to learn how to play the guitar. You can, you can sit there and try to watch all the YouTube videos and read all the books and try to figure it out on your own. It'll take you a couple of years, but maybe eventually you might learn how to play a song on a guitar. Or you can hire a guitar teacher who's going to sit right beside you and is going to teach you how to do it, teach you how to hold the guitar, play the guitar, whatever. And if you make a mistake, they slap you upside the head, make sure that you do it over again properly. <laughs> so which is the path that you want to go? Most people like to do the YouTube thing. And God bless you. Go right ahead. But I have learned from experience. And the reason why I have received the successes that I have is because I have paid. Yeah. All right. And our final question, what was your biggest mistake and what did you learn? The biggest mistake I made was in a real estate deal where I've always been inclined toward cash flow. I'm a cash flow kind of guy. And I kind of discounted appreciation. And I had a particular property. It was a 48 unit building in Toronto where I bought it for $4.7 million. And it was a real beat up property, spent money in renovating it, was able to lift the rents up substantially. And then five, six years later, I was looking at this property. I was interested in buying more and wanted to buy more within that area. But the property value had appreciated so much that I was like, this is craziness. This can't continue. And so I sold that building for seven and a half million. So I did really, I did well. If I had held on to that property, Christopher, that 4.7 million today's dollars would have turned out to being 18, 20 million dollars. It gives it just give you an idea or a sense of what appreciation can do for you. So I always suggest to new real estate investors that cash flow is very is important and should be top of mind when you're looking at buying properties in the, in the beginning. But ultimately, once you've got that sort of set, figured out and set, you need to start identifying those properties that can appreciate, dramatically appreciate in value. And there's areas to route, even in your city, there are neighborhoods and pockets, some markets that are going to appreciate much more dramatically than other areas located in your city. You have to identify them. And it's difficult to pay for that nut. And it's difficult to find to pay because of the amount of money that's associated and the lack of return that you get on them. But those are the properties that have made me really dramatically increase my net worth. It wasn't the cash flow. It was those properties that appreciated so, dramatically. Van, what you're saying is the person who bought that property from you for $7.8 million and made three or four times as much money as you did with substantially less work? Yes. <laughs> it's so interesting. What a great lesson. Like from a risk aversion standpoint, like cash flow is huge. Like if a recession comes, you know, having that cash flow can save your bacon and allow you to hold on to a property longer. But no, nope. you know, if you find the right property in a hot market that's appreciating and you buy it at the right time, I you get lucky. Hey, listen, Chris, I told you I'm a cash flow guy. And that's why I preface my comments by saying, you know, if you're getting started, cash flow is king and I would concentrate my efforts. But if you really want to see dramatic increases in your net worth, cash flow versus appreciation, appreciation. So you need to mix your, you need to diversify your holdings and try to accommodate those properties that will give you a much higher chance of appreciation. And as you touched on, there's some issues with that because if there's a change in the market, if there's a change in interest rates, those are the first, those are the first ones to drop. But mm-hmm. if you want to see, if you want to see dramatic increases, you got to mix it. You got to, you got to get some of that appreciation. I guess one of our strategies that I'll share with before we go is that AJ and I rarely sell a property. It's so rare. Like once we've done all that work, you know, you bought that dilapidated property in Toronto and doubled its value. And that required a massive amount of work, like acquiring it, negotiating the deal, and then creating the value add, doing those scopes of work, finding the contractors, like living through every little detail, staring at those ceilings. And, you know, those are probably years of your life. And for us to sell a property where we've spent so much time and energy that could have that potential for appreciation after that work's been done, you know, we just don't like to sell them. No, no. Hey, listen, I understand exactly where you're coming from. And I am not also, I follow the same logic as you. But also, I will say that 
It's like a garden where you have a variety of different vegetables and fruits in that garden. There are different times when that fruit or vegetables ripen. And so I look at my portfolio in that regard in that there are particular investments that I have made, whether it's an office building, medical building, apartment building, house that goes through a span where sometimes there's capital improvements you need to, need to make to that property that is better off to walk away from and move that property, you know, the profits off of that into something else. I'm constantly reinvesting, but it, sometimes it's not necessarily you constantly you do that reinvesting in that individual property. It could be in another property. So that's what I'm. Do, that's what I mean, or that's what I'm doing. And I understand oh. where you're coming from. Oh, absolutely, man! Thank you so much for coming on, and we really enjoyed it. Do you want to let our audience know how they can reach you? Well, I encourage everybody to, if they want more information on me or just get more information on the proper system or ways to be able to do a renovation rehab, to go to my website at vansturgeon.com. There's a bunch of information there that I've got a free training video. And also, I've got some you know, tools like a free renovation calculator that you can download. They'll be able to help and assist you in determining what that budget should be on a renovation rehab of your property. And I'm out there on Facebook and social media if you want to reach out to me through Messenger and I'd be more than willing and happy to be able to have a quick chat with you and to be able to guide you in the right direction. I'm really doing this because I really, I really want to help people and I enjoy engaging people and helping them in their, in their journey. Well, man, thank you so much for coming on. Yeah. Thank you very much for having me. All right. Have a great rest of your day. Okay, you too. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Real Estate Professionals Investing Podcast on WIN, your community for investing knowledge for growth. Please take a second to rate us so that we can get more great investors to interview. If you or someone you know wants to be on, please go to westsideinvestors.com and fill out our form.